our purpose this morning, since we are commemorating our anniversary, I would like to call your attention to the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua. Remember that God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning of time, He created man and woman, Adam and Eve. And how He made a garden in a part of the world that was in a region called Eden. And that is why that garden is called the Garden of Eden. In that garden, God lived with that man and woman and the other earthly creatures that God had made. But then sin entered that garden that was meant to be protected from unholiness. A creature from another world entered this world and infiltrated into that garden in the form of a serpent and told lie to that man and to that woman and caused the man and the woman to doubt God and to follow Him. When sin entered that garden and man and woman became sinners, God chased them out from that garden because God cannot live with sin. God is perfectly holy. But God promised the man and the woman that He will provide an atonement. Someone will come and die for them in order to take away and wash them clean from their sin. And the day came when Adam and Eve was chased out of that garden. We come now, brothers and sisters, to the time of the universal flood. Men and women populated the world, and after many generations, there were so many people across this world. And you know what? Because they have already descended from Adam and Eve, all of them were sinners. And you find that this world became a very violent world, a lawless world, a wicked world. So wicked, so violent, and so horrible a world that God said the time has come to destroy this world. Because those who would want to obey God find themselves threatened. They cannot live in this world because nobody wants them to be part of this world. They were threatened with their lives. And so God sent a universal flood only Noah and his family were preserved. You find ourselves now in that world. That is why we are told just recently in our newspaper that scientists have discovered that on top of Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, on top of Mount Everest, scientists discovered after the melting of the ice that the top of Mount Everest is actually made of marine clay. You tell me. The highest mountain. How come the material up there is actually marine clay? You know what's marine clay, right? It means the top of Mount Everest. Mount Everest was once upon a time, long, long ago, down in the ocean. How did this happen? Because the scientists say, oh, wow, they were movement and this and that, that. But the Bible tells us, Noah and the universe of God. So, brothers and sisters, you come to the time of Abraham. And God promised Abraham that the Savior will come through his family. That is why the Savior is known as the seed of Abraham. After a few more generations, you come to the time of David. And God loved David. And God promised David that the Savior would be the seed of David. And how history continued to unfold until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, born from the family of David in the town that David was born in, the town of Bethlehem. But before all these things happen, you find that, brothers and sisters, the people of God in ancient time find, found themselves in the land of Egypt for 400 years. Why? Because, you see, like you and I, they were disobedient to God. And God sent them to Egypt. 
and they were in slavery. Slavery become a picture of what it is for us. We are slaves in slavery to sin. They were slaves in Egypt to the Egyptian. When they left, they was they were given a leader by the name of Moses. But Moses, like everybody else, he died. His successor was a man called Joshua. And that's where we find ourselves now as you come to Joshua chapter 4. And it came to pass, when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan River, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourself twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourself twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan River, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan River, and each one of you take up a stone on your shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these, two, these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan River were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan River. The waters of the Jordan River were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so, just as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones from the midst of the Jordan, as the Lord had spoken to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them to the place where they lodged, and laid them down. Then Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of the Jordan River, in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So the priests who bore the Ark stood in the midst of the Jordan River until everything was finished, that the Lord had commanded Joshua to speak to the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. And the people hurried and crossed over. Then it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over, that the ark of the Lord and the priest crossed over in the presence of the people. And the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. About 40,000 prepared for war cross over before the Lord for battle to the plains of Jericho. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Then the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Command the priest, who bear the Ark of the Testimony to come up from the Jordan River. Then Joshua therefore commanded the priest, saying, Come up from the Jordan. And it came to pass, when the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan River, and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land, that the waters of the Jordan River returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. 
And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel cross over this Jordan River on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the water of the Jordan River before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. You find here a fantastic event. You find here something that, that, that does not occur every day or even very frequently. You find God performing it the second time. The first time was when Israel crossed the Red Sea, the Lord by Moses stopped the flow of the water so that his people could cross and escape from the Egyptian on the on who were pursuing them as though they were walking on dry land, even though they were walking through the Red Sea. And so here it happened again. The Lord stopped the flow of the Red, not the Red Sea this time, but the Jordan River and allowed his people to cross a second time. Not one time only, but twice. To demonstrate this, brothers and sisters, that God has the power to do all these supernatural uh, acts and events. You find the ancient people of God, they were commanded to remember this particular event. And how were they to remember? One representative from each of the twelve tribes were to go as they crossed the, the river, to go into the middle of the river, and as they crossed, to take one big stone each and put it on their shoulder and walk across and to reach the western side of the Jordan River and there they will be assembled as a memorial as we are told there in verse 7. Joshua led the people and Joshua commanded that the memorial was to be erected and constructed. You find brothers and sisters three lessons for you as you commemorate our church anniversary this Sunday morning. You find firstly, brothers and sisters, that a memorial is for spiritual instructions. That is what you are told in verse 6 and verse 7. This may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, say, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan River were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And this stone shall be for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. It is good, brothers and sisters, if your children were to ask you questions, especially if it is a question about God and what God had done in the past. In fact, it is a Christian duty to teach people, young and old, new and old, about what God has done. For example, just a few verses. Firstly, to Psalm 44, if you look there in Psalm 44, on, uh, during the uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting, I read for you Psalm 44. Once again, remember what you are told in verse 1. You are told, We have heard with our ears, O God, our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in the days of old. See there, brothers and sisters, the responsibility to teach. 
to teach your children as well as to teach anyone who would ask you for a reason or explanation. Again to Psalm 78. And look at what you are told in Psalm 78 from verse 6 to verse 7. That the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And so here, again, it is emphasized the responsibility to teach the new generation, the new people who join the church, people who are new to the Christian faith, and people who may be new to you, and they want to hear you are supposed to tell them. You see, brothers and sisters, that is exactly what Christians are told to do. Christians... You have the responsibility to teach and to learn about what God has done in the past. For example, if you turn now to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew 28, to the Great Commission. And what do you find the Great Commission uh, 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 instructing you to do in verse 20? Matthew 28 and verse 20, teaching them. To observe all things that I have commanded you. You have a duty to teach others. Teaching them. To teach others, it implies that you yourself becomes a learner first. How are you going to teach others if you yourself have not learned? And so therefore, the responsibility to teach and to learn. Again, another verse. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. And here you are told in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, And the things you that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So you are told clearly that you as a Christian have a duty to learn, but also have a duty to teach others. And that's exactly what you find from the apostles and the early Christians and how they learn and how they teach. For example, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, as you look into the windows of their church life, in Acts 2 and verse 42, this is what you find the early Christian doing as they serve the Lord as a church. Acts 2 verse 42 And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. You find that, that they continue in the apostles' doctrine. The word doctrine, the modern word is the word teaching. The apostles' teaching. So they were learning. They were learning from the apostles. And why did they learn? Well, they want to know. They have a desire to learn. But more importantly, later on, after they have learned, so that they will be able to teach others, which would be the command, the commission of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I have to ask you, brothers, sisters, this morning, as you come to commemorate our church anniversary, do you have a heart Learn what God has done in the past and what our Lord Jesus Christ has taught His people as it is recorded in the Holy Bible. Do you have this desire, this longing, this interest to learn? Look at the word of the Great Commission, to observe. To observe means to fulfill a command. The word to observe is actually a military word, a military term, a word used in the Greek, by the Greek army, by the Roman army, the word to observe. It means the demand to obey an order. It means to hold fast. It means to watch with full attention. That is what the, to observe means. 
to watch with full attention, with the desire to obey. Because you are a soldier. You are given an order, you will obey the order. That's what a soldier is. You have to obey the order. And so it is for you as a Christian. Is that your desire as well? Very quickly to our second point, brothers and sisters, and that is this, that a memorial is also a reminder of what God had done in the past. That's what a memorial is, is, is meant to be, for example, in the sense of these 12 stones collected from the midst of the Jordan River. And uh, we are told in verse 7, isn't it, of Joshua chapter 4, that it is meant to be a memorial to the children of Israel uh, forever. It is meant to be a memorial. I want to call your attention, brothers and sisters, back to Joshua chapter 4, and look at what you are told again in verse 21 to verse 24 about this, that the memorial is a reminder of what God had done in the past. Verse 21, chapter 4 of Joshua. When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. So you are told here, brothers and sisters, clearly that a memorial is meant to remind God's people of what God had done in the past. In history, a memorial, the word memorial means a record, a reminder. So a reminder, so a record of what God has done. You are to remember, that's what a memorial is supposed to be. What is the purpose? It is to recall, it is to remember, it is to retell what God had done in the past, in this case, what God had done at the Jordan River when the children of Israel crossed from the east side to the west side, God stopped the flow of the water. Now, a memorial is not something that is long, long ago or something that is strange. We do it every month, you know, as Christians. Because Christians, we have a Christian memorial. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 24 to 25. These two verses, you will find a repetition of the word remembrance. He say, do this in remembrance of me. These two, as often as you eat, drink it, in remembrance of me. Reminder. To remind. To record. That's what we do every month when we partake the Lord's Supper. What is the purpose? Well, you are told in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till He comes. So, the Lord's Supper is to remember what the Lord has done and the end of His second return to earth. What about the stone in the days of Joshua? To remember what God did in the crossing of the Red Sea. And why do you have every year an uh, anniversary? And an anniversary, an anniversary is meant to be like a memorial to remember, to mark this occasion. Every year we remember why we exist as a church. When a church has become uh, an established church of many uh, years or, or hundreds of years, 
Uh, people attending the church sometimes they forget the purpose of their existence. They take things for granted. But we may not, and that is why some of you may think, oh, you heard, Pastor, why you bring back bad memories? Why you want to talk bad about people? Why do you want to recall what happened in the past? Ayah, let us concentrate on the future. Don't talk about why we came and start this church. We have to. We have to repeat. We have to recall. We have to come to remember the purpose why we exist at all. Yes, it is true that many people do no, no longer share the vision, they no longer share the calling. It's good, it's, it's fine. But if you are still here, I hope you still share the same story and you still share the same calling together as a church that we are a Reformed Church, that we exist to proclaim the Reformed faith, and that the Reformed faith must be defended because it is generally misrepresented by people. There are a lot of sincere people, nice people, sincere people, and they think they love the Reformed faith, and so they like to say Reformed faith, Reformed faith, but when you listen to them and ask them to explain what do they mean by the Reformed faith, you'll be horrified. You'll be saying, huh? But that's not what the Reformed faith is. Then you'll realize, brothers and sisters, that these sincere people, they are misrepresenting the Reformed faith because they have been told wrongly. And so those of us who know the truth must stand up and stand for it. Even though we live in a time where Frankly speaking, a lot of people are not interested. They are just interested in going to a church. Especially go to a church where they have many friends. And so actually they go to church not because of what the church is teaching, but more so because I have many friends there. I have I share a a, a past with these people. And you you did tell me, brothers and sisters, if you are a fair minded person. Is that the right reason why you are attending a certain church? We must attend a church because we believe what the church is doing, the mission of the church, is worthy of your support. Yes, it may be big. Yes, it may be small. But it is the mission that is very important. Our, what is our mission? What do we stand for? And that, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, is what we must remember as a church. We come to the last point now, and it is an important point, and it is this, brothers and sisters, that a memorial is like a reference point in time of controversy. When Joshua led the people to cross the Jordan River, you are clearly told here, brothers and sisters, in verse 12, in Joshua chapter 4 and verse 12, that the men of Reuben, the men of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh crossed over armed before the children of Israel as Moses had spoken to them. Now, if you are not a frequent reader of the Bible, you may be wondering, stranger, I mean, there were 12 tribes. Uh, why did they mention these two and a half tribes, huh? Uh, what was so special about them? Well, because of these brothers and sisters, these twelve, these two and a half tribes, they were already allocated their land on the eastern side of the Jordan River. They were already given their land, these two and a half tribes. So when the people were required to cross the Jordan River to go and conquer and possess the land on the western side of the Jordan River, these people on the the, the eastern side may be wondering, so do we need to go or not? We already got our property. Do we need, why, why do we need to go over there? Nothing to do with us, what? Hey, your problem, right? Like, you go and deal your own problem. We already got our land. And so Moses, when he was still alive, told them, no, that's not the right thing to do, okay? You have to go over and help your brothers and sisters. You cannot be selfish. 
You cannot think that, oh, I already got my land and therefore your problem. You cannot think like that. We must stand together as a nation. And therefore, they obeyed the Lord, they obeyed Moses, and so they crossed together with their brothers and sisters, fully armed, ready to help their brothers and sisters conquer their land. They were not selfish people. And I hope that Christian people are the same. You may be well. Everything about your family, okay. You're healthy, your children are okay, everybody okay. You are happy with your job, your marriage is okay. But brothers and sisters, you have to help to look after others in the same family of God whom you know to be in trouble. You must spare some thought for them. You cannot be inward looking and like Donald Trump, America first. And don't care about other nations. You cannot do that as a very selfish uh, mind that he's trying to introduce to the American uh, nation. God said they have to go over and so they went over. However, you see, there was a problem. After they had gone over together with the other tribes to conquer the land, after the land was successfully, victoriously conquered, of course they have to go back to the eastern side, alright? Go home, finish work done, I've done my part, I have helped my brothers and sisters, right? now it's time for me to go back to see my family. And so they went back and crossed the Jordan River. Now I want you now to turn to Joshua chapter 22 and see what happened. Joshua 22. When they crossed the Jordan River to go home, this was what they did. In Joshua 22 and verse 10. And when they came to the region of the Jordan River, which is in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben, the children of Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh, they built an altar there by the Jordan River, a great impressive altar. And so, as they cross there, eh, about to the cross over, they built this altar. Now, the rest of the people who saw what they did, we are told that in verse 16, go there, chapter 22 and verse 16, the rest of the tribe saw it as a sign of treachery. The word there, treachery, means sin, means rebellion. It's the people, was, was the people trying to do something build an idol or what. So the people sent Phinehas, we are told that in verse 13, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the high priest, to investigate. They asked, he asked the people who built it, the two and a half tribe, why did you do it? I mean, we have just successfully conquered the land, now we let you go home to your family, but why must you do this thing? What is your purpose? Now look at what, how they explain in verse 24, chapter 22, go down to verse 24. But in fact, we have done it for fear, for a reason, saying, In time to come, your descendants may speak to our descendants, saying, What have you to do with the Lord God of Israel? For the Lord has made the Jordan River a border between you and us. You, children of Reuben and children of Gad, you have no part in the Lord. So your descendants will make our descendants cease fearing the Lord. So, if they say we build this, just to remind you all, uh, and to remind ourselves, uh, that though we are going to cross the Jordan River to go home, hey, this Jordan River, uh, it's not supposed to be a separation to separate us from one another, no. We are separated by this river, but we are still one country, you know. Huh? And we want to make this impressive altar to, to be a memorial, to remind you and your descendant, and to remind ourselves and our descendant that look, this was what we did. We came over because of you. We are going over because we are going home after we have helped you. That was their intention, the purpose. Now, let, look at what we are told then in verse 26. Therefore we say, let us now build, prepare to build ourselves an altar, not for burnt offering, 
no false sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between you and us and our generation after us, that we may perform the service of the Lord before Him with our burnt offerings, with our sacrifices, and with our peace offerings, that your descendants may not say to our descendants in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. Therefore we say that it will be, when they say this to us or to our generation in time to come, that we may say, here is the replica of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made. Though not for burnt offerings, not for sacrifices, but it is a witness between you and us. Far be it from us that we should rebel against the Lord and turn from following the Lord this day to be an altar for burnt offerings, for grain offerings, or for sacrifices besides the altar of the Lord our God which is before His tabernacle. And so you find the explanation given. There is a reason why we build this structure. It is meant to be a reminder. It is meant to be a witness. It is meant to be a, a memorial in case in future there is a controversy. So you find there the need for a memorial, you find there a need to celebrate, for example, events like an anniversary in order to give us an occasion to recall, to reflect, to remember. Why did we do what we do, what we did? Or why did we come together, the pioneers, 24 years ago, to start this church? Why we, were you not happy back in the in the old church? There were rumors at that point in time that uh, we started this church because the pastor was uh, not happy being number two there, and he wanted to be number one, his own boss. That's why this church was started. And I've always been telling people, look. I was not the founder of this church. I didn't lead the people to found this church. The people who eventually became the pioneers of this church, actually, originally, they were on their way out. They were leaving for other churches. When they heard that we were also leaving, they called for a meeting and together we decided that maybe instead of going to different churches, why not come and build a church? And we find ourselves a place in Geylang so that we will not be too near to the old church and be accused of stealing sheep. And we make it a point from the beginning that we will not steal sheep. We will not invite anybody from that side to join us. And that's why uh, we are what we are today and we are struggling because we are not interested in inviting people from other churches to join us. Instead, we want to have people who are new, who are truly converted, we are more excited about that and I hope to remind you of uh, the reason for our existence. So brothers and sisters, I hope to impress upon you this, that we do not celebrate anniversary because we want to have a reason to have a big market session or take photograph session. No, no, that's not the reason. It is to allow those who are new and our children to remember that though you were not here when this church started, remember there is a reason why we started. We could have been like joined a one hour of the many churches already in Singapore, but we do believe that there is a reason why we are what we are, because we belong to a group of people around the world who are called Reformed Christians. And Reformed churches around the world, generally speaking, are very small in size. Because a Reformed gospel is not loved by the people who love the world. Reformed Christians have only one calling, to please God. And so a lot of things we teach, a lot of things we defend, the world cannot agree with us. And those who follow the world, of course, they will not agree with us either. But we must remain true to God. And that's what I want us to recall and remember. I wonder, brothers, sisters, those of us who remain here this morning, are you willing to be united 
and to work harmoniously once again to build up this work. There is nothing here if you are thinking of fame and glory. There is nothing here for those who wants to have fame and glory. It's just hard work here. And I want to impress this upon everybody here, that we are a pioneering church. We are not a settled church. A settled church is a church with their own property, with a very big group of co co in the congregation. They are self-supporting. They are okay. They are already established. We are not. We are a pioneering church. And being involved in a pioneering church requires a lot of special uh, 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 sacrifices. Time energy and then we, we bring our family along then our family will suffer from the fact that we are a small congregation they don't have many friends and, and, and a lot of hard work we have to fetch people we have to uh, do wear so many hats in this place brothers and sisters this has been made known and this should be known and be reminded by everybody we are not just a church we are a pioneering church. We are different from the established church. In an established church, you can go to church every Sunday and be lost. Whether you come or you don't come, nobody cares. Nobody even know whether you are there or not there. And whether you do or serve God in anything, you are not really particularly appreciated because there are so many people who can do your job. But in a pioneering church, when you're absent, hey, the seat that you normally sit on has an empty seat. So people take note of you. And when there is a work and nobody wants to volunteer, it is very glaring. The same old people who have to do the same old job every year in and every year out. And so I want to remind you that this is a pioneering church. We are here to dirty our hands. Therefore, brothers and sisters, to be in such a church, there's great reward. There is the smile of God upon you and your family and lives, but also requires a lot of stamina, energy, as well as commitment. And I hope to remind you, use this occasion to remind you. Are you willing to work together to make this church a family a place where others will be willing to join us. Our goal is not that there will be hundreds and thousands of people. That, let's be realistic, that's not our goal. Our goal is that those we know, providentially God has placed in our lives at work, in school, our homes, our family, who are still not Christian yet, that we'll bring to church. That has always been why Mary and Salem has brought their sisters and relatives to come that is why we have always been saying invite your nephews and nieces your colleagues and your friends and bring them to church that's how we want to be as a church and then there were times when people ask us how come your church has no activities huh? you know public holidays you all don't organize anything and we always have to remind them that's intentional we are not a Bible Presbyterian church, a VP church. Every holiday also got something going on and people get so tired, so committed and family members get so fed up that, hey, hello, how come every time church, 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 you don't even visit your father, mother? You don't even visit your loved ones. You don't even have time for your loved ones. It's always church, church, church. And that is not what we want to repeat in our congregation and ministry. Rather, we would rather have you spend time with and build up strong relationship with our loved ones and your friends and your colleagues. Meet them during holidays. And then I hope you do not forget that the reason is because you also want to invite them to come to know the Lord and if possible, if they are willing, help them to come to church and support them throughout. So let me just reiterate and remind you of all these basic work practices, ministry practices that we are trying to foster and build on together. So we are here. 24 years, a lot of people in people's eyes may think that we are not very successful, but it doesn't matter to me as a pastor. 
the time will come when my time as a pastor is gone. You know, I may die any time and uh, someone better may come and take over. So be it. But while I'm here, I will do my best, my brothers and sisters, to minister to you. I do not want to be an intrusive pastor where I intrude into your private space and lie. That's not the kind of pastor I believe I should be. However, if there is any one of you with any need, let me know. You know I'll be there. You know I'll do my best to serve you, visit you, spend time with you, if there is a need for it. However, if you do not tell me, then please do not blame me because I don't know what's happening. Because I do not want to be an intrusive pastor. There are some pastors who are very happy and they boast about it that they know everything about everybody who attend their church. And they are very, uh, they are like the Matthew Po or the, the newspaper, you know, that anything they call a the pastor. Pastor, you know what an age is? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But I don't think a pastor should be there. But a pastor should not be ignorant of the need of his congregation because the congregation must let the pastor know so that the pastor can carry them before God in prayer. So let's work together. You have your job to do and I have my job to do and let us together care for one another's spiritual well-being and pray for one another and by the grace of God let us harmoniously serve God together. We will now stand together to recite our covenant of church membership.